agenda, we have the presentation and discussion regarding the industrial park development. So Scott. Can I, um, I, I apologize, Tracy. Um, can we, can we back up and ask you to reopen the meeting? We have to do the, the five seconds countdown for Gordon and our. Uh, oh, thank uh, God. I didn't realize that. Yep, you're right, Brian didn't do that. Okay, so for Gordon, I'll give you the five seconds. We'll do five, four, three. Good evening, Canby. We're going to open the work session for uh, April 7th, 2021. We're calling this to order. Uh, first on the agenda for the work session is a presentation and discussion regarding the industrial park development. Scott? Thank you, uh, Council President Hensley and uh, Council members. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this work session is uh, is going to be uh, centered on our industrial park development, and this is intended uh, to be informational for you, uh, Council members, uh, as just a um, a check in on um, kind of a refresher on the history of our industrial park and the work that has been done to date. Um, some of the current projects that we are working on and, and then some of the potential or upcoming projects uh, that we're looking at. Um, the uh, uh, Jamie Stickle, our economic development director will be leading the conversation with you here. And I'm gonna turn it over to her in just a moment here. Uh, but we're also gonna uh, hear from a couple of other folks. Um, Ryan Potter, our senior planner, will talk a little bit about the, the development process. We have a guest on um, actually on the uh, Zoom here. Um, Colin Sears is a regional development officer from Business Oregon, and we'll be covering some development trends and uh, talking a bit too about the strategic investment zone. Uh, and then uh, lastly, um, City Attorney Joe Lindsay will uh, be providing some additional feedback for you for kind of some um, legal and city council considerations as we. Uh, continue to move forward and talk about our, our industrial park development. So that's just sort of uh, the purpose here is just informational. Of course, we'd love to help answer any questions as we go uh, through this conversation. So at this point, I'm gonna ask Jamie Stickle uh, to come forward and, um, and uh, provide you this presentation. Good evening, Jimmy Sickle, Economic Development Director. We'll just pull up the presentation, one moment. Perfect. Um, so yes, this evening we wanted to provide a general update for you on the Candy Pioneer Industrial Park development. Um, obviously some of our counselors are new, others have been um, with us for a, a bit longer, but we thought that it would be a good opportunity to build off of the work that Don Hardy did at the, the last um, city council work session on March 17th. He talked more about residential and land specifically. Um, so we thought we would, we would um, provide an update on industrial park development. Scott um, gave an overview of, of how this meeting will run, um, but I'll, I'll provide a general overview um, planning process will be Ryan Potter, and then the development trends and incentives, Colin Sears, additional considerations, Joe Lindsay. I put questions and discussion at the end, but obviously with a work, um, a work session, if you have any questions as we go along, please feel free to you know, raise your hand or unmute, and we want to make sure that this is a, a dialogue. Um, so the Candy Pioneer Industrial Park is the economic engine of Candy. Um, it has 300 and, over 360 acres that are zoned um, and served with utilities and available for light industrial um, developments. It was master planned in 1984, so about 36 years ago. And that was with input from local property owners as well as city staff. Um, the park itself was established in 1999, um, and it's approximately two thirds developed at this time. And so I wanted to start off with how businesses find candy. Um, and what I did is I, I made a kind of a list of, the, of some of the different ways. So obviously there's brokers that represent the land for certain parcels. 
Um, sometimes businesses come to us. Kitty Hawk is a business that, um, while they're not necessarily our, in our industrial park, they did come to Canby because they were looking for a space along I-5 in Oregon, and they really felt like this was the right place for them. Uh, they landed off of um, South Pine Street. Um, so sometimes we hear from businesses just looking for land, um, looking for buildings, just looking for an opportunity, really. Um, property developers. So we have Trammell Crow that has developed property in, in our industrial park, um, but there are lots of other property developers out there. Sometimes they help to bring utilities to the site, or they might um, they might actually develop a building and then sell it. Um, that would be the case for Columbia Distributing. Um, private property developers. <laughs> hey, Jamie. Sorry to interrupt. If you're actually going through slides right now, we're still on the, or at least I'm only seeing the page one on the slide. I'm not seeing the other one. So I don't know if you're actually going through slides or if this is just an okay. intro before we get into it. This is what makes can be attractive. Does it say that now to you? No. No, we're still on page one. Yep. Can be Pioneer Park Development, the opening page. Okay, one moment. Okay, and I'm hearing from our IT department that you should be seeing what's on our screen. So just one moment. I believe that if you stop sharing and then reshare again, you'll get the right screen. On Zoom, you can only switch screens a couple times and then you get hung up. This happens to me 16 times a week. I was going to say, it doesn't sound like your first room. Can you see a, a page that says industrial park projects? Excellent. There we go. Uh, thank you, Councilor Tibbles. Um, so private property owners, uh, there are private property owners that market their own properties without the assistance of a broker or developer. Um, requests for information. So these often come from um, Business Oregon, which uh, I believe Colin might note um, later in the presentation, but Business Oregon sends out requests for information. Greater Portland Inc. Um, also, sometimes they send out the same information. They act as partners in providing a complete package on the available sites in the area. And then additionally, um, site selectors, this is both my last point and the last people that send requests for information. So um, they, site selectors are companies, usually national companies, but we have some um, locally that tour sites. So if, um, you know, Jamie Incorporated is looking to build a new building on the West Coast off of I-5, um, they would help to find, to narrow in on the sites that would be big enough for, for that site. Um, and while obviously all of these, this, or all of these um, entities can work individually, oftentimes they work together um, with the assistance of the city. So we might provide information um, with a request for information to a developer um, and as well as assist by ga ga um, excuse me, gathering um, sites that are available from brokers. So it's usually a, a quite the mix. And um, the reason for these pictures is I was on a call recently that had site selectors um, from across the nation, I think Texas, Chicago, and I can't remember the third. And someone said recently, if you can eat it, if you can drink it, or you can wear it, those are the um, businesses that they are seeing most often um, these days looking for a new location. Um, additionally, uh, I, I reached out to Greater Portland Inc. today, and they explained that they've really seen, while things were quite kind of quiet in the 2020, which we can imagine why. In 2021, things have really started to gain speed again. Um, and they have seen um, a, a switch from urban to submarkets. Uh, so Canby would be a, a, a submarket for that location or for it location wise. Um, and you know, usually when we're working with these different um, organizations, entities, businesses, there is a level of um, confidentiality that is part of that because private property owners or the developers or even businesses, they might not want the word to get out. Businesses, um, especially sometimes if they're relocating, they don't want word to get out before they're able to tell their, their um, employees or 
you know, like like many contracts that we could imagine, you know, until the ink is signed, then it's not um, that it's not open for public discussion. So um, it's a lot of background information, and then eventually, you know, we're able to make it uh, come to the light of day. I think about Project Shakespeare that was talked about as Project Shakespeare for a very long time as it walked through the the planning process, and then um, finally, once everything was signed, it was able to be. Um, announced that it was Columbia Distributing coming to Candy. So, Tracy, I want to... can I make a comment about that? Sure. Yes. Go ahead, Greg. Jamie, I know I know that you're following your standard practices, but I've had a conversation with our city administrator about the way we've handled this in the past with code names on these things. And um, I just don't find it acceptable that um, the people who will be voting on tax breaks become the last to know. And so it is my expectation that if there is anybody kicking the tires in Canby that whose presence and interest is being conveyed outside of staff, that is to the mayor or council president or any one member of the council that it be shared with all of us. We can go into executive session and use an ORS 192 involving corporate secrets to talk about this. But I think if we can't trust our city council to keep a secret, then why are we even doing business? So I, I sort of felt blindsided by at the last minute being asked to approve a project I had heard nothing about. And so that's something internally that I hope staff uh, discusses because my preference is uh, we don't repeat that. Understood. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate your comments. Um, so one of the things that makes can be attractive, or not one of the things, many of the things that makes can be attractive, um, available land. We do have um, land that's available. I know that Ryan is going to touch on this later. Um, we have small parcels down to an acre. We have larger parcels up to 40 acres, um, even greater if you connect a couple of different um, adjacent parcels together. Um, our location within the greater metro area. I think anybody who's driven into Portland can even attest that, that it is a pretty busy place to be, but with access to Highway 99, 205, and I-5, um, it allows for um, greater mo mobility around the greater Portland Metro and then outside of that as well. Um, nearby airports. So while some um, some businesses or, or sorry, some cities might have the luxury of being close to one airport if they're lucky, um, we actually have the Aurora Airport that's located about 10 miles outside of town and then um, very close to the Portland International Airport as well. Um, and, you know, I, I think about that Aurora Airport just the ability to fly people in and out for deals. I have a, I remember a friend in Yakima saying that the company that he was the CFO for, that they flew down from Yakima, Washington to Canby to go visit um, ICC Northwest because they were looking to do a deal with them. They, they popped down, they didn't even have enough time to stay for lunch, which was um, unfortunate for, for Canby. I think unfortunate for them to miss an opportunity on the great restaurants that we have. But it is such a draw for these larger companies that that do have private planes to be able to shuttle, um, whether that's in the state or even outside to nearby states. Our local utility providers. Um, one of the things with having the local utility providers is it helps to keep costs down. Um, I've heard estimates of up to 30 percent, but it also helps to have the availability um, to reach out to, you know, whether it's Candy Utility or Northwest Natural. Um, to be able to connect people with the, the person who deals with wastewater for the city, um, Dave Connor. So it's, it is very nice that we are not only able to keep costs low, but that we are very available, whether that's internally with the city, with city staff or externally with our, with our partners. Um, and then the community, you know, I think the reason, one of the reasons that we all live in Canby and all love Canby is because of the great sense of community it provides. And, um, and having that sense of community with restaurants and shopping um, 
you know, local grocery stores and, and, and other amenities that we love, uh, whether that's attractions um, like the Clackamas County Fairgrounds or Swan Island Dahlias, all of those items help to make candy attractive for a place for businesses to be. So I wanted to give um, a, a, an additional overview on some of the projects that have come to candy in the last couple of years. So Premier Gear and Machine Works, uh, they do gears that could be an inch small up to you know, hundreds of feet long. Their facility is 60,000 square feet and they opened in April of 2018. They're on Sequoia Parkway, so, excuse me, Sequoia Parkway. The BE Group, um, so the BE Group, sorry, Premier Gear, I should say, they moved here from Portland um, where they opened in, I believe, 1925 in the, um, in the Pearl District. And they are, I believe, a second generation family company. The BE Group, um, 60,000 square feet, they opened September of 2018. Um, and, and they create pressure washers, generators, air compressors, water pumps. Um, they are a third generation family. Um, Columbia Distributing. So they came, um, they opened their doors October of 2020. They are a 500,000 square foot facility. Um, and then they also um, took part of the strategic investment zone. So that was the first strategic investment zone application that the city had received, um, as well as the county had received um, for that streamlined zone. And I know that Colin will speak more to that in the upcoming presentation. Some of the projects that are underway at this time, um, Caruso Produce, they are approximately 90,000 square foot. It will be a climate controlled distribution warehouse um, facility with office and then accommodations um, for future expansion. That's going to be on South Sequoia Parkway and Walnut Street. They are a second generation family, or maybe it's a third, um, which I only note that because I think that that is a trend when you start to look at our businesses in our industrial park. And I think that that's one of the things that really connects our industrial businesses with our community, that many of the people that, that we know as leaders today have longstanding histories in candy. And um, I look forward to these businesses, you know, create, putting their mark and having longstanding histories in candy as well. Um, Stanton Furniture, which is approximately 150,000 square foot manufacturing and warehouse with office. They create um, furniture, uh, big high-end couches, and they will be off of Southeast 4th and South, Southeast Township. Um, both of those, Caruso and Stanton, are currently in Tualatin. So they will be um, moving in. Caruso hopes to be um, moved in in May. And Stanton um, just, just finally got their walls up. So uh, we should see some additional progress there. Alpha Sense is a, is a smaller building, 10,000 square foot, light industrial with office. It's on Sequoia Parkway. Um, they came here from Westland. And they create, develop, manufacture, market um, insect pheromones that are used to lure, trap, um, and, and for pest management. So kind of a unique business um, that is here in Canby. And then some upcoming projects. Um, Baker Center, which is across the street from, across Walnut Street from Columbia Distributing. Um, that is a spec building or spec buildings at this point with Trammell Crow. Um, Candy South is also a Trammell Crow driven project. Those are the developers that are trying to do work in our industrial park in addition to Columbia Distributing. Um, that project is at Township and Sequoia Parkway, so the Wygant property, um, if you're familiar with the Wygant family. Both of those are spec at this time. Um, they are hedging their bets on Candy that, that they believe that they'll be able to recruit a business or businesses to come to Candy. And so they have started through the um, planning process with the spec, the you know, speculation and, and moving. Well, we, we will see more information coming out on that. Um, Dragonberry, which is a long time um, candy business, is looking to do phase two of their business development. And so um, they are in the very beginning phases of that. And then also, I know that Ryan will be talking about infrastructure, which is a very important thing um, when you're talking about how you move people and trucks through the industrial park. Um, but the Walnut Street extension is something that, um, you know, we talk about a lot with potential new businesses um, internally with our other partners around the state, um, because 
finding a way to move trucks and traffic from the industrial park to Highway 99 in a more direct route and provide more options for those um, those in cars and trucks to get out to Highway 99 will be a very important thing um, for the future. And I know that um, you know when you talk to people who live in Canby and or work at other places in Canby, um, you know that's something that I hear often is very important to them as well. And so with that, I will turn it over to Ryan Potter to talk about the um, the development process. Good evening, uh, Council President and uh, members of the City Council. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, so um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview of the industrial park through the lens of planning and land use. So I'll, I'll start off with zoning. Um, as, as most of you know, and you can see on the map, um, most of the land in our industrial park is zoned for either light industrial or heavy industrial. Um, and then there's a few other zones at play, but that's the vast majority. Um, the white bubbles sort of in the middle are actually unincorporated um, land that's not within the city, but could be annexed. Um, and then we have an overlay zone for the whole industrial park that applies to all of the industrial park that is within the city. With those zoning designations come um, their own respective chapters of our municipal code. So one of the things that um, the zones uh, mean is that there's a range of acceptable or conditionally acceptable land uses for those different areas. So the one we see uh, most often lately with the project coming into the park is light industrial. And so this one has the most exhaustive list of types of uses that are um, permitted um, without a conditional use permit. And so these are things like manufacturing, fabricating, processing, and then I've listed a few more up there. Um, and then there's also conditional uses uh, that are uh, identified in the code. Now, heavy industrial is, so our zoning code is in some ways nested. So heavy industrial really permits all those things already mentioned under light industrial, and then it has a few caveats. So there's additional conditional uses, and these are things that are allowed with a extra layer of evaluation and analysis and conditioning. And so one of those is aggregate removal, um, but then that chapter of the code also has a matrix for um, evaluating other heavy industrial uses, and that's sort of an open category. Um, but there's a tool in there for determining if um, a proposed use would be allowed. And like I mentioned, there's an overlay uh, district that applies to all these parcels, and there's a, this, re, this includes additional requirements. These are some of the ones that we talk about quite a bit, um, including um, the employees per acre requirement that we changed in the last couple of years. And then also there's some requirements around um, retail being allowed if it's um, sort of accessory to the main industrial use and, and a, de a determination of whether or not that's appropriate um, commercial use. Um, and then unlike those, uh, the underlying zones, this overlay zone also includes a really explicit list of prohibited uses. And these are um, really either hazardous or nuisance heavy, um, unattractive uses that we, that we obviously don't want in our industrial park. Things like slaughterhouses, landfills, nuclear power plants, um, things of that nature. And so Jamie actually mentioned this, um, but from a land use perspective, one of the great things about our industrial park um, compared to a lot of other ones in other communities is that we really do have a diversity of lot sizes. And this has um, resulted in a, a diversity of land uses. And so 
I think we often most talk about these bigger projects that have come in in the last few years, but we've also seen um, a wide array, array of small and medium um, light industrial projects. And I've, I've highlighted four of them um, that have been completed in just the last couple of years. Um, and, that, and that's really because our the way our industrial park was subdivided, there, there's, um, like Jamie said, there's uh, properties that are up to 47 acres, but there's quite a few that are under one acre. And this really creates a lot of flexibility um, for new businesses um, or expansions of businesses that are already here when they're looking at our industrial park. So Jamie asked um, for me to highlight just a little bit about our processes. So um, we have a variety of application types that the planning department reviews for projects that come into our industrial park. And so a vast majority of those go through design review. And that's perhaps the most um, well-known mechanism for review of projects that are, that are coming in. And so there's a variety of steps that go into the design review process. The first thing are, are sometimes early uh, conversations with potential applicants um, with really high level conversations about whether a use is allowed or not. Um, but then before a applicant is allowed to um, apply for um, development review, uh, we require in almost all cases uh, for a pre-application conference and this is really where the planning department, our public works department, um, our consulting city engineer, the county, uh, county utility, and then other related agencies um, all get in the same room. Although right now that's over Zoom, um, but it's getting everyone in one place to really discuss a potential um, project before it's officially um, submitted for land use review. Um, in addition to design review, uh, we also see some projects have a lot line adjustment or partition component. That's when there's either lot lines that need to be moved or if, um, like a few of the ones Jamie mentioned, they've partitioned pieces of the, the property up to allow for several tenants or buildings. Um, once design review, um, once a project goes through design review and is approved by the planning commission, um, the next steps are there's a uh, pre-construction conference and that comes before the public improvements um, can begin. Um, if there was a lot line adjustment or a partition, there's a final plat um, that's reviewed by us and then the county. And then once the buildings or structures themselves are going to be built, there's a site plan review process that's done um, at an administrative level. And that can either be for the buildings or often if there's a speculative project or a multi-tenant building, um, we would also do site plan review of the tenant improvements because that's what the county requires before they will uh, sign off on building permits. There's also um, a few items that our department um, has a say in on, on projects in the industrial park has sort of related, but outside of the land use process that includes certificates of occupancy. Um, that's really the last check that um, we in the county, it's actually managed by the county, the process, um, but that's Candy Fire, us and the county and others making sure our project is safe and um, has complied with conditions of approval before um, the businesses or people can move in and use the buildings. And then the last, um, the planning department also signs off on business licenses. So when new, build, uh, new businesses are coming into the industrial park, we also, that's another chance for planning staff to make sure that um, proposed businesses um, comply with the, um, the permitted uses in the zone. And then just this last, or the second common, um, second column are less common processes that um, you, you may see in the industrial park as well. Some projects include variances, which is where they're deviating from uh, development standards. Um, generally, there needs to be a, uh, a hardship related with that. 
conditional use permits. Um, both those zones I mentioned both have a list of types of uses that are allowed, but they require a conditional use permit. Um, and then there's also modifications or an administrative level uh, review that we do when there's small changes to a project that doesn't re uh, really change the analysis that was originally done. And then this body, um, yourselves often see appeals if, if um, a project is appealed from planning commission. So this is something else that Jamie um, mentioned, but obviously one of the biggest things that we look at when, um, it just, when projects are coming into our industrial park or, or proposed to come into our industrial park is transportation. And this is someone that, something that um, definitely everyone in the community is sensitive to. And um, it's definitely something that's heavily analyzed in the, in the land use appro approval process. So the first element is traffic studies. Um, most traffic studies in the industrial park are uh, prepared by the city's tra transportation consultant, which is DKS and associates. Um, and the analysis they do is um, varies based on the project, where it's located, its overall scale, how many trips it's gonna generate. Um, the city does have adopted thresholds um, that um, influence the conclusions of those traffic studies. And then um, one of the things they do is, um, and often they often suggest uh, mitigation for the impacts that a project might um, have on our infrastructure. And so in addition to that traffic study, um, the city also has city standards. And then because industrial park is on the edge of the city, there's also some streets that are um, the county's facilities. And so the county's uh, standards come into, a, come into play as well. And so I've included a couple of photos. Um, these are all around Columbia distributing because I thought they were um, kind of representative of the up, kinds of upgrades um, to our street network that happen as parts of projects as they come in. And so you know, the biggest picture that you see on your screen is First Avenue. Obviously, that was a much narrower um, road before the adjacent project came in. And as you can see, there's a new bike lane, sidewalk. Um, and then also on the bottom of your screen, you see ADA ramps um, and also street trees. And so an important part of the way we build our infrastructure or, or develop it in the industrial park is the improvements that are related to the projects coming in. And, and one, of the re one of the reasons we care about the scope um, and design of those improvements is really about connectivity. And so I think the city has been um, trying to have a lot of foresight and, and thinking ahead on um, the types and level of um, transportation service that we provide in this area, because obviously a lot of these businesses generate a lot of truck trips and those truck and normal vehicle trips are, are an important aspect of their business. And so um, a couple of the more recent ones that you're probably familiar with, but Sequoia Parkway was extended um, down to the south side of town in, in 2014. And that really made the Southern part of the industrial park a lot more um, accessible from 1990. Um, and then just more recently, the Sequoia Hazeldale signal um, became operational. And that really um, addressed a lot of the mixed traffic that um, comes through the heart of our industrial park and then onto the highway. Fourth Avenue is something that's um, being built gradually. Um, as Jamie mentioned, Crusoe Produce and Stanton Furniture are both are side by side and they're both, they'll both be building parts of 4th Avenue. And along with future development, those projects will all be contributing to a facility that will eventually um, create more connectivity through the park. And then perhaps most importantly, and something that um, I, I know has been on your radar because the council just um, approved an amendment to our TSP to reflect it, is the Walnut Road extension and roundabout on Southeast First Avenue. 
And this will really give our industrial park um, what I would think is a, is a sorely needed um, direct way to get from the heart of our industrial park uh, directly to 99. So these are just a couple of pictures of the things I, were, I was just talking about, the Sequoia Parkway extension. And then this is a picture of the, the new signal that's in at Hazel Dell. So um, this is just a little exhibit I made. Um, there's no real science to this, um, but I, I thought it could kind of serve as a window in just how us planners think about traffic and circulation um, as we see uh, these industrial projects come through. And these arrows are kind of meant to convey the idea that right now Sequoia is our main way in and out of the industrial park um, as a way to get to 99E. And so one of the things we really think about is if a new project is coming in, how do we get those trucks and employee uh, vehicle trips to and from Sequoia so that they can um, get to the highway? And um, so that kind of overall design scheme will be supplemented by the new connector road um, that's going to be an extension of Walnut. And this is something that we talked about um, a few months ago when we uh, approved the TSP amendment, um, but eventually there will be a, a roundabout and then a connector road that connects directly to 99. And this is something that um, the city is definitely motivated to complete and continue, continues to work on. And so the, just the last thing I wanted to mention um, was something that Dawn talked about at um, the last work session that we had on planning and land availability. I know he also talked about residential quite a bit, um, but something that we have been seeing in our industrial park from a land use perspective is demand is just really high um, for the land that we have in our industrial park. There's a lot of demand for both bigger projects and smaller and, and medium sized projects. And so the, the land that we've had available in our industrial park has been a huge asset to businesses coming here. Um, but there is quite a bit of it that is now spoken for. And I've, I've highlighted just some of the bigger um, pieces of land that are in, in our industrial park, but you'll notice that a lot of them are either businesses that are already there, new businesses, ones that are under construction, or ones that have been proposed. And so I think we are possibly getting to the end of a, of a, um, a phase of growth um, in our industrial park, but we do obviously have opportunities for additional um, business growth. I have a, I have a question uh, regarding that map. Uh, area number 11 can be south. Is that a uh, business, all the other things listed are businesses, or is that just future available industrial space? Um, that That's one of the Trammell Crow projects that Jamie had mentioned earlier. And that's one that um, has been partially submitted, but that hasn't gone to a decision yet. Um, so that's something you'll you'll be hearing more about um, in the near future. Thank you. And so, um, unless you um, unless members of the council have any questions for me, I, I will turn it back over to Jamie. I've got a couple of questions, Tracy. If that's okay. Yes. Go ahead, Councilor Parker. Ryan, first of all, people make fun of uh, death by PowerPoint. I got to say, that's one of the better PowerPoints I've seen. And that uh, circulator map that you put together, I've never seen that before. So I appreciate that. Um, I want to applaud staff and the Planning Commission for having the bike lanes put in uh, on uh, Southeast First and South Milano. And Ryan, on the, on the slide that you showed us, uh, it didn't look like there was bike lanes on First Avenue and Walnut. But I just, I just want to say from my standpoint, as, as we develop this area, I want to make sure that we have bike lanes uh, everywhere. Uh, Council President uh, Hensley, you heard that they're going to do a roundabout there. I think that's a, an amazing thing. And um, 
<laughs> and and let, let me just say that, that there is a possibility, and we haven't seen the budget and that sort of thing, but we may be having some stimulus funds come to us. I would just like to say, I want Walnut. <laughs> I want Walnut, and everybody I run into at Thriftway wants Walnut built sooner than later. So if, if we do have some additional funds available, that's my preference that we put in on it. Um, also, and, and Ryan, this may be a piece of it you don't know, but I, I, would, I would like somebody on staff to take a look at the transportation inputs that when we designed and updated the transportation studies in and out of the industrial park, I do not think that it was anticipated we would have super big uh, industries like Columbia Distributing and whatever else is coming in there. So I would like us to double check uh, to see whether those inputs were correct and, and whether they need to be adjusted. And, and finally, and I apologize, Ryan, because I don't think this is really part of your job, but um, the point of the industrial park uh, really wasn't jobs uh, as, as uh, members of the original um, committee um, worked on 30 years ago. It was, it was to develop high value industrial land so that homeowners didn't have to pay for all of city services. And what I have yet to get from the city staff um, is what good this industrial park is. Now, I don't know if Columbia Distributing has hit the tax rolls yet, Maybe it hasn't, uh, but according to the county assessor, initial estimates that the total amount of income from all of the city, from the 200 new homes being built and the expansion at the industrial park, the total tax increase is $350,000. That's it. So I would like staff as, as we progress down this road uh, to be able to give me and, and other counselors um, information that when we're standing there in the checkout line at Thriftway and people say, I hear there's 500 cars going in and out every day to the industrial park. What are we getting out of it? Um, so that would be some key information that I'd like to know. Um, I've asked for us to be able to get desegregated uh, tax information to find out how much those 200 homes brought in and how much the industrial land brought in. But I, I really think we need to test this theory that was proposed years ago, that the industrial park was going to be bringing us substantial sums of property tax revenues, and, and, and I'd like to prove it. And then the second thing, and, and I talked to Kyle Lang, the chamber director, and he has not seen this information. And, and Jamie, if, if you could put this together for us. But the other thing that's talked about with the advantage of the industrial park is jobs, 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 jobs. I have not in 11 years seen a study on how many of the jobs in the industrial park go to people in this zip code. So in order for me to be able to defend this industrial park and I guess we're going to have another SIZ coming down the road. I want to be able to say, okay, guess what? It gets us two new police officers each year or, or whatever it is. But right now, I do not have the information necessary to develop our existing policy. Council. Anything else, Ryan? I, I have some additional questions, if that's okay, Council President. Go ahead, Councilor Spoon. Thank you. Um, and not all of these are for you, Ryan. You just happen to be the one sitting there. But um, first, I'll second a few things Greg said, just for the record. Um, I would love that tax information as well and the job information. Um, I'd love to see bike lanes whenever we build. Um, I think our cycling base, the amount of cyclers is growing, and I think that will continue to grow. And it would be nice to be able to accommodate them without interfering with traffic. Um, and then um, I also second um, Jamie and Scott that, you know, anytime information on the industrial zone and the industrial park goes to the mayor, I think that all of council should have the same information. We are the ones that ultimately vote on 
things down the line. And the mayor is always the first one to say his only authority is the agenda. Um, so it would, it would be nice for us to get the information. So we have more time to process it before we vote than what we ran into last year. Um, my question for Ryan though, is on one of the slides, Ryan, you said that DKS was the city's transportation consultant. And I guess that was kind of brand new information to me. I know a lot of people in the community have been frustrated by some of the traffic studies or questioning their accuracy. And of course, not many people are traffic experts, but are they officially our consultant? Do we have a contract with them? I don't remember ever agreeing to a contract. Do we not bid those jobs out when that comes up? How did that come to be? Um, you know, that's actually a good question. I, I'm not sure that we do have an ongoing contract. I think that's something we just tend to use them. And, um, but some applicants do other do use other traffic consultants. We don't require applicants to use DKS. Okay. So I, I'm just concerned by the idea that we're promoting that this is the city's, you know, traffic consultant if it's not. And maybe we could clean up that language a little bit to make it more clear. If they're not our official traffic and if they are official traffic consultant, we should probably be approving a contract with them. If they aren't, we probably shouldn't use that language. So thanks for the clarification though. Yes, that, that's a good comment and, and thank you. Any other questions for Ryan? Okay, then I guess we can turn it back to Jamie. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Colin Sears. We're working on stopping sharing right now. Um, and Colin Sears is from Business Oregon. And so he'll provide uh, some additional input on um, development in the region, as well as the strategic investment zone. Great. Thank you. Can uh, everyone hear me? Yes, we can. And welcome, Mr. Sears. Thank you. Uh, nice to meet everyone. And I'm sorry, uh, I'm not able to join you in person, but hopefully, hopefully soon enough. Um, so my name is Colin Sears. I'm with Business Oregon, and I've been with the agency. Uh, tomorrow it will be eight years. And I just I know that because my son turns 15 and he was, uh, you know, quite a bit younger when I started. So um, anyhow, uh, I'll give a little bit of background on myself very quickly. I'm going to try to keep my presentation to about six, seven minutes max, hopefully a little bit shorter. But um, so my background is in economic geography. I moved from the East Coast 21 years ago. So I've lived in Oregon longer than anywhere, uh, anywhere else, the other states I've lived in. Um, I have been working on business recruitment with Business Oregon until uh, about a month and a half ago when I transitioned into my current role of Regional Development Officer for Clackamas, Multnomah, and Washington County. So that's one of uh, 12 regions in the state. And I am the face of the agency out for both our business development programs as well as our infrastructure programs in the region. And uh, having worked statewide doing both domestic and international business recruitment uh, since I joined the agency in 2013. I'm, I was really down in the weeds on uh, pitching sites like yours to both domestic and international uh, companies as well as regional companies who were looking to expand or relocate. So I'm just going to highlight a few trends so you get an understanding of where where things are today. Obviously, the COVID situation and the global pandemic, uh, you know, Jamie, Jamie alluded to that earlier, that really shook up where the economy is. And I know we're, we're all probably watching and listening and seeing where things might go. And, and it looks like things are going, moving in a positive trend. But a few things I want to highlight. So, um, our key competitors, as far as new expansions uh, or business recruitment, tend to be Washington State to the north, uh, Idaho to the east, as well as Utah these days for, for projects that are looking at uh, the northwest or the, the greater west. You know, California has so many impediments to investing there that 
a company will only go to California if they have to go to California. But when a company looks at Oregon for investing and creating jobs, um, you know, they're usually looking at Washington. They're usually looking at Idaho. And so uh, the competition for these jobs, you know, it's, it's competitive. It, it has been for quite a while. Oregon is, you know, we have moderate incentives, modest incentives, but not aggressive. Um, and I'll, I'll switch over to the SIZ and talk about that. But essentially, um, land is quite limited in Oregon because of the urban growth, uh, you know, um, planning structure that we have. And so uh, it was nice to hear Ryan's comments. And, you know, you've always obviously had a lot of absorption uh, of your industrial park, the site. I've been out to the sites many times, uh, touring the sites. It's an excellent site, you know, great position regionally and geographically. And so it's, it's a great site. You know, I would, I would say great site for companies who are looking to be in the region, uh, as well as companies who might be looking at the West coast, especially on that light industrial warehouse distribution, uh, those types of uses. It's very well situated. Um, so, so the development trends really, as they stand today, I think back to Jamie's con comments, you know, we have a lot of growth around food processing, uh, a lot of growth around distribution, um, customized manufacturing or, or value add manufacturing and assembly, those types of projects where the jobs are generally paying higher wages, you know, definitely in the, uh, the mid mid thirties, 40,000, 50,000 and up average wages. So those are the, the trends we're seeing. Having sites to switch over to the incentive piece, you know, the, the simplicity of having someone, a company or a site selection consultant working for a consultant understand how they would move forward if there are incentives uh, makes sites and communities far more attractive. And many communities in Oregon are eliminated from site selection consideration because they don't have any type of incentive or um, uh, even negotiated things like SDC fees that might be uh, paid, paid for over time. So having worked statewide for eight, almost eight years, just shy of eight years, I can tell you working on projects where we start with 20 sites or 12 sites, many are eliminated that do not have incentives. So it's just information to share. I understand this is a work session. And uh, where Oregon is at a competitive disadvantage, uh, two places, obviously, when, we, when we're competing with our neighbors, uh, the income tax, obviously, when we're competing to the north, uh, we you know, we're at a disadvantage there. And then uh, the system development charges tend to be much higher than our neighbors uh, in Utah and Idaho and Washington or whatever language they use. And then the fact that you have to pay for many of those costs up front versus where in other, other states and regions, those can be amortized, wrapped into uh, other programs. And so... That's that's where we're at. I do want to. I'll switch quickly to the SIZ and why that's why that program is is so nice um, as far as businesses and site selectors uh, view it. But I do want to address the code names issue. So the there is a workaround for this code name issue, which is signing of non disclosure agreements. So as we work projects, seventy five percent of Recruitment leads come into the state and we have a blanket NDA. If your community is selected as a finalist, we can always just add you to the NDA so that you can understand who that company is and, uh, you know, learn all about them. I mean, there are companies that, uh, you know, they have a bad rap for, for some reason or another. And you probably, I understand wanting to know that ahead of time. So non-disclosure our standard non-disclosure agreement, we can, I just wanted to bring that up because that question came up. So the strategic investment zone program, and I'll, I'll wrap it up quickly. I don't like, I know you guys understand the minutia, but the, the strategic investment program 
was started uh, over 30 years ago when Intel was looking at Arizona, Oregon, I believe California for an expansion of a new semiconductor fab facility. And Oregon had lost the competition for that for that for for a project and the head of business Oregon and the governor at the time said let's let's come up with a program where we where we can be more competitive for these larger projects and the strategic investment program was born and then out of that the strategic investment zones were created and obviously, Clackamas County uh, went ahead about a decade, well, over a decade ago, to to implement the two rural SIZs, of which you're included in in rural SIZ number one, Clackamas Rural Strategic Investment Zone. So, um, I'm not going to get into the minutia. All of you know that, but at the state level, I'm going to hit one more point: the land availability. We we have a massive lack of available in industrial and light industrial land statewide so so you should understand the you know i guess the advantages that you have for having that land and having that resource available and i'm i'm here for the rest of the session so um you can ask me questions now or when we open it up uh, i'll be happy to answer those but before i uh, i'll zip it and let you fire away any questions you might have of me right now, Tracy. Does anybody have? Does anybody have any uh, urgent questions? We do have another item on the work session agenda, and I want to make sure we get to this council meeting on time. So, does anybody have any urgent questions for Colin at this point? What's the next item, Tracy? Uh, city administrator six month review process discussion shouldn't be a long discussion because I think it's just about the process that we're going to go through on the executive session. Well, I, I do have a couple of questions. Okay, go ahead. Mr. Sears, thank you for, for showing up here. Appreciate uh, oh, yeah. no, take, you're welcome. taking the time uh, to do that. Um, I, I guess the thing that's at top of my mind is that whenever I talk to businesses in town, and I'm thinking of uh, Shimatsu, last time I talked to the HR director of Shimatsu, uh, she said that she had a 50% turnover, that she was always in recruitment. When I talked to the chamber director, uh, he said he says there's not a week that goes by that he doesn't get a call from a business saying, I can't find workers. Uh, would it surprise you to find out that businesses in Canby are having difficulty finding workers? And how is that going to be helped if we bring more businesses to town that need more workers? Um. Great question. Great issue. Uh, workforce is a critical issue for companies and employers throughout the U.S. right now. And we've seen this massive transformation to where, you know, the, the restaurant or pub employee who stopped working during the pandemic as, as lockdown after lockdown occurred, that person can't go in and become some type of, uh, you know, manufacturing foreman over at Shimadzu, right? That's the, they just don't have the skills. So, Actually, so going, that's not true. I was told that they had assembly jobs that they could take people off the street and uh, put them into, but they make less than $22 an hour, which is what is needed in order to afford an apartment in Canby. Understood. Okay, great point. And I was just, I was drawing an analogy. I wasn't really. Um, but this workforce training and upskilling issue is a major, it's a national issue. It's a global issue, uh, you know, in the Western developing nations. So so it's something that uh, the state is cognizant of that and redirecting resources towards workforce workforce, you know, not just training, but retraining and retooling and working with employers directly for on the job training. Um, it's, it's an issue we're well aware of. We don't have enough resources to adequately address it, but it's something we're well aware of. You, you raise a great point. Um, so well, I'm not the first time last week, I actually had a business owner, 
uh, manager of one of our industrial companies say, are you guys still out there recruiting more businesses so that I'm going to have a harder time competing for employees? Now, this is something I've been thinking about for years and that um, the unemployment rate in Canby is lower than the rest of the county. And so if a company moves to Canby, people are going to have to commute here. And that just increases our traffic, which then makes me want to know how much we're getting out of taxes. So I'm I'm proffering the, the concept that I have not been proven that more industrial businesses benefit the city. Can you can you make a a case that it is? Well, I mean, there there's a lot of elements, so I'm not gonna go into all of them, but I think. Uh, you know, first and foremost, I do want to address the comment, you know, you made earlier, which is a great point. How many of, how many of your residents are getting these jobs? Well, we operate in a regional economy where there are not boundaries. And I think the way economists, you know, you could do an economic impact study to see how much these employees are spending at restaurants at, um, you know, groceries, doing errands, things, even if they lived in Tigard, but commuted to a job in Canby, how, what are the average expenditures? There are ways to evaluate and track those things. But yeah, I, I want to be 100% transparent and, and um, straightforward and, and answer that uh, you would need to do an analysis, track what those tax revenues are, tax what those other expenditures within the community are and how those are impacting your businesses. So, so, you know, I'm, I'm coming at it from a regional perspective to where we see, you know, you have residents who are, who are going into other jurisdictions for their, you know, their places of employment. And that's how a regional economy works. So it's, um, and I, and I, it's not so straightforward. Yeah. And you don't need to defend demographics, but every day, 8,000 people in Canby drive to a job in Portland and 4,000 people drive to Canby to work in service jobs that don't pay enough for them to live here. And that's why people think we have a traffic problem. It's not because of the people who live here and drive around. It's because we have people washing back and forth and not being able to live in the communities that they live. And so again, you know, I spent well, all of my life with the idea that that cities want to get jobs, and and now I'm at a point where I'm saying, prove it, show me how okay. this improves well, the quality of life for our citizens. Yeah, well, let me add one point. Um, I I'll, I'll add one point, and and you raise a great point, and and this is a conversation, right? This is a workshop. So so, uh, I would the knowledge or, or experience I would I would share with you is that there are communities around the globe who have decided that they will focus on higher value, higher wage jobs for at least a component of their industrial land. And uh, you know, the city of Hillsborough and Washington County, obviously they're let's say they're lucky or they're blessed with a major high-tech uh, you know employer with Intel and having, you know, they have the cachet to be able to pull that off. But, um, you know, it's certainly, it would, you know, I just put this out there as not, I'm, I'm, I'm here to present and share information and my knowledge and experience, but, you know, you could certainly uh, make a decision to dedicate a portion of, um, you know, the park or, or, you know, for certain types of projects, you could also, you could boost incentives or the incentive tied to higher wage projects. And, you know, research and development, especially around high tech and manufacturing, those are high wage jobs. And across the board, there's a lot more research and development activity occurring in Oregon um, over the past decade than, than the few decades before. You know, that's those are good types of projects to target, um, and those are those are jobs that those people could afford to buy a, a home and can can be and live there. So, so you raise some great great points. Um, you know, targeted recruitment 
of certain types of industries and sub-industries to where you can at least capture a portion of higher wage jobs would make a ton of sense for your for your site, especially given the competition going around with industrial land. So yeah, you know, that it might take a little bit longer, but the West Coast, the West Coast is growing. I mean, back to demographics, the you know, the cards are on our side right now because Western US is growing. Young people are moving here, people are staying here. Um it's it's an attractive region. So I, I'll well, shut I've up with that. I quoted former Governor Tom McCall, who said that Oregon is lovely and demure, and she ought to play a little hard to get. Council President Hensley, thanks for your indulgence. Thank you, Councilor Parker. Thank you, Mr. Sears. Councilor Spoon, didn't you have a question? I did. Thank you. I'm just happy we got to hear uh, Greg uh, quote Tom McCall again. He just didn't use the voice to the full effect. Um, Colin, thank you for coming in and talking with us. I do have a question. I really appreciate you helping us understand how the SIZ came into place and why it exists and kind of what precipitated it. I do have a question, though, that would be helpful for me. Um, one of my frustrations as a city councilor is that the only SIZ project we've had, and I guess the only one in the county, has been a distribution center. So while I understand some manufacturing facilities, we might be competing with Arizona or Utah, distribution centers are going to exist in a pretty limited location. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so one of my frustrations is, you know, it's this statewide program to attract businesses, but frankly, distribution center is likely to go somewhere in Oregon, whether the SIZ exists or not, because they have to be every so many areas, right? Like you, you, they have to be in a pretty limited scope. So yeah. could you help me understand why distribution centers are included in the SIZ if it sounds like it was intended to keep businesses in the state? Because I, uh, for, me, for me as a city councilor, and this is what is the frustrating part is, um, not the highest tax amount for the size of the business because there's not a lot of permanently installed manufacturing equipment that help, helps raise the real estate value. And on top of that, it cr generates more traffic than a normal business, which means it's a bigger burn on our infrastructure. We have to build roads to accommodate the additional traffic. They're paying less in taxes and they probably would have been somewhere in Oregon anyway. So I'm just trying to understand why distribution centers are included well, I understand manufacturing makes more sense to me. If you could help me understand that. Well, I think, I mean, to be honest, this this is way above my pay grade, or or um, <laughs> but but I can tell you the it's a political decision, and it's it was a political decision that was made during the last economic downturn, I believe, that distribution centers were included because at that time. I think Oregon was most of the U.S. was was desperate for any type of of job. So I'm not I'm not I'm not I'm not shooting that down or saying that these are bad projects. Um, they're certainly often we do compete with Washington for those jobs. So generally, the rule of thumb is companies will have somewhere between. I mean, the non Amazons. Let's say the other companies will have between about seven to seven to 10 distribution centers and spread those out based upon the demographic model and population uh, modeling. But the, uh, in this case, you know, I, I believe just a decision was made to, distribution is a technically a traded sector job because those goods are being dis distributed throughout, you know, well, beyond Oregon, but I know that in this case, I, I that that one probably um, serves primarily Oregonians. So, um, so not not a hundred percent sure. Uh, I could certainly research, you know, the history and get back to you and get back to Jamie on that. Yeah, I'd really appreciate that. I, I I think that probably some distributions are farther apart. In this case, it's alcohol, which is all run by the OLCC, and I can't imagine they would have been in you know, another state, but I, I would be curious um, just as we move forward, if I need to lobby to the state to make some changes or or whatever needs to happen, it would be helpful to understand that. And I really appreciate you bringing your expertise here and, and helping us understand Business Oregon and the SIZ a little bit more. It's it's probably going to be a significant part of our coming years and it helps us to have that information. So yeah. Thank you. yeah. And I'm always happy to come back, you know, maybe it's in person sometime. Uh, I'm available. Jamie has my you know, cell phone number and everything. Um, 
you can all email me if you have follow-up questions. I think it's, um, you raised some really good points. You know, I, I mean, the one thing that I just want to maybe hit home again is because of Oregon's strict uh, rules on bringing in new industrial sites. Yeah, being 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 conscious about what you do with those remaining sites, and uh, on the one hand, is something you need to think about. On the other hand, uh, you don't want those sites sitting there for thirty years or forty years. I, I mean, I'm being, I'm I'm, I'm just <laughs> you know, there's there's nice middle middle ground there, but um, you know, you know, these programs can always be amended. They can always be. Um, Things can be changed. Obviously, that does need to go from, you know, the the, the legislative side towards business Oregon. But you know, we're we're in a new era, and we don't really know. You know, many of these massive economic changes that started with the first lockdown last March, um, we still don't know the ramifications and how those are going to to pan out. But I I certainly understand the concern about you know. If um, the or whatever the enthusiasm for creating more high high wage jobs in those sites, you know, definitely, um, you know, we'll do anything we can to support Jamie and you to to attract those types of projects there. Thank you, Mr. Sears, Councillor Bangs, Tibbles, Farwig. Do you have a question before we end this piece on the agenda? No. Okay, um, well, that uh, thank you, Colin, again, for your coming and sharing, um, enlightening us on the ins and outs of SIZs. The information is very helpful, so I appreciate your time tonight. Thank you very much. Have a, have a good evening. Thank you. You too. Bye. Council. So, if I may, no? I just had a Go ahead. under this uh, topic, if there is time, are we, how, how close are we on time? Uh, it's it's currently 715. The next agenda item is the city administrator six month review discussion, which I know that the mayor wanted to be a part of. So I was going to set that aside to the next meeting, being said it wasn't urgent. But did you have a piece that you wanted to share or did you want to wait for the mayor? Um, no, I what I was going to do is, is kind of do a final considerations on this topic. This Perfect. Um, but I. I would say, well, either way, um, if we set over the process till the next meeting, then the process was going to drive the actual evaluation, which was going to be on an exec session next time. So we were only simply going to talk about process, but if we don't hammer down process, then of course it'll put the evaluation down to the, the next one as well. So just so you know the ramifications. So if you want me to step away and let you do for 15 minutes of process talk, that's fine, but if not, uh, we have that 15 minutes, I'd be happy to share my considerations that I would like you to consider uh, about the industrial park in the SIZ. Um, I'm gonna go with that. Okay. Uh, Scott, are you okay with us setting aside the process discussion? I am. Uh, I understand that um, the mayor had some kind of a work issue or some other issue in couldn't participate here, and I this uh, discussion about just the process itself uh, was requested to be on the work session by the mayor. So I think it does make sense to hold that discussion over so that he can participate because I can't provide you with any uh, reports or any um, kind of talking points on that. Right, it was at his request, so I'm going to remove that from the agenda tonight so that he can participate. So Joe, go ahead with your considerations for the SIZ subject, please. Cool. Well, and so when I hear the conversation, especially I, I hear some of the comments that Colin was making, um, I would say that there are counterpoints to some of his discussion points. Um, and some of those are um, the city as it approaches these matters, you know, the, the city has a role, really, we get taxes and we provide services, right? And there's employees in there, but they're, we, we provide those services uh, that we provide and we try to provide them well. One of the services and the missions, I think, of, of the economic development 
section of our service is not to get rid of potential suitors. It's to draw in suitors for businesses as you know, our participation in trying to get businesses. And one of the reasons I wanna be kind of almost strict about that approach is because ultimately these are landowners using their land. And it, we as a city have processes in place, as you heard the, the planning process, which kind of helps facilitate, but also kind of lets them know what the regulations are and how to meet those regulations, right? And then it goes into the public sphere, first in front of the planning commission, and it's in the public, and then in front of you guys, and it's in the public, and that's oversight and making sure that those regulations are actually applied, right? And it's for the public. And then there, and that's also taking into consideration some policy, clearly, and you guys can, can talk outside of that process about policy, but once your policy is in place, those are the goalposts that guide the rules that you're applying to every applicant. And, and so we always have to treat applicants the same under similar circumstances, wh wherever the goalposts are. So, so part of, I think, what was missed in Colin's presentation, in all due respect, was that the, there's, you can't make everybody happy and you can't be all things to all people all the time. But, you know, we might not want, you know, maybe in our heart of hearts or if you're playing SimCity and you're making your city and you want a certain amount of things in your city, there is the optimum or perfect approach. And then there's maybe the, the worst approach. And then there's sometimes in the middle where kind of reality often lands. Um, it, there is a danger in knowing that there's a landowner and somebody trying to develop or contract with that landowner to buy their land. That landowner wants to sell that land no matter who that, uh, you know, or, or what type of business that is. And so we have a lot of regulations in place to make sure you saw the prohibited ones like slaughterhouse or nuclear dump site or, or landfill. And those seem, I guess, obvious to us. But if we don't have that enumerated list in place before somebody comes, if that landowner wants to have a contract with the developer and they meet our code, it's really hard for us to go, now hold on, we're rejecting you like a, you know, a parent where two teens have already agreed to go to the dance together. So I, I just want you guys to make sure and, and consider that. And then the other thing is, it, it, you know, there's one thing to um, we we kind of fall prey to this idea that I, I heard different levels of things. Like regionally, maybe we're all kind of partnered because if our region does better economically, then maybe we'll do better. Uh, I heard statewide stuff, like maybe our state is against other people in competition, but truly the city is in competition with all the other cities around us too. And so I didn't want to lose sight of this idea that we are in a system where everybody else offers something. And so, and we're actually an active part of it. And so I, I think there is a certain reality about, we live in a world where maybe we want to hold out, but, uh, if, if you have two contractors and we're going to get more tax dollars to go ahead and be able to provide better services um, in, in real time, it, it's, it's this dance that I just thought that the conversation that Colin was giving you saying that maybe, you know, you want to only aim for the stars. Well, you have to do it, you know, using your given sky and then you have to, maybe sometimes fall short of perfection and, and uh, realize that we don't actually want to interfere with certain people's contracts. So those were some of the points that I wanted to make. I know that's maybe not as, um, it probably opens up more discussion than, than we have time for today. The other yeah, thing we, I wanted to say was, Colin um, said- I have a couple you, of questions I see, Joe. Oh, okay, that's cool. Colin, um, Colin said that, uh, do you want do you want to ask those now or do you we need to get them asked now because we've got to wrap up this work session so <laughs> Councillor spoon had her hand raised first yeah all right thank you really quick um joe i hear what you're saying i i'm not concerned about interfering in contracts but i'm wondering if maybe we could have another work session 
about the SIZ and in the industrial park, really more targeted on what we want our policy to be. Not that we would interfere, but I think we could target our recruitment to businesses that might, maybe we, you know, see if there's a consensus on what we actually want to see in the industrial park, knowing that we don't get to make that decision finally. But if we're going to spend time, energy, and, um, you know, money recruiting businesses, if there is a consensus on what type of businesses we'd like to see there, maybe we can tar target our recruitment there instead of a blanket recruitment on businesses that we don't want to see here. And the other thing is about, um, you know, over a year ago, we said we would revisit the SIZ. And I understand that some things changed in the world in the last 12 months, but I really think that this conversation maybe might precipitate or, or lead us to, to realize maybe we need to have a work session discussing our future with the SIZ. Um, and part of that is, is I kind of object, Joe, to the idea that every business is a victory. I think that there are instances where the cost of having the business in town, if that exceeds the taxes they bring in and they're not hiring local people and those people aren't spending at local businesses, like I think we just kind of need to revisit and not make a base assumption that having someone take up land in the industrial space is automatically a victory or a win for the town because I think it depends on the circumstances. So my, my ask is just maybe we can have another work session discuss what kind of businesses we would like to see in the industrial park. If there's some consensus on that, create a policy about targeting our recruitment. And then also if we can finally have that work session on revisiting the SIZ that we talked about over a year ago, those would be my two requests at the end of this. Thank okay. you. And Councilor Tibbles. I mean, I would just uh, echo a lot of the sentiments of Councilor Student and Councilor Parker on that. I think it, it comes down to we should always be able to uh, speak to our constituents as to the value that we're bringing through these businesses and be able to answer those questions. And I think when we're assessing, we should use the most amount of data that we possibly can. Um, and that could, you know, result in a more targeted approach to recruitment or it could not, but without getting that data, I, I just don't think we're doing um, the best that we can on behalf of our constituents. So I would, I would just echo those points and getting that data to make those informed decisions. All right. Thank you, Councilor Tibbles. Um, yeah, at the end of the day, we can't. Uh, yes, Councillor Banks, I see your hand. Yeah, I just want to add <clears throat> on to what Councillor, um, well, actually, all of you said now, Councillor Tibbles most recently. I don't see any value in meeting again for a work session until we get that information. Um, I feel like we're vacu or, or operating in a vacuum here. If we don't know how much benefit we're getting from the existing properties, it's very difficult to, to assess adding to that. Thank you, Councillor Banks. Um, yeah, that's so what I was going to say is at the end of the day, it is not our job to pick and choose commerce, but I don't have any problem with targeting recruiting. Um, at the end of the day, the property owner gets to make their decision and do what they want with their property, but I don't have a problem with deciding what we'd like to see and go after that. Um, so I would actually like to see Scott work on getting that kind of a data and um, bringing it back to us in a work session. We did talk about the SIZ about this time last year when um, Columbia had theirs going on. And um, I was all about cracking that thing back open too. So let's, um, let's plan for a future work session on this um, if sort of staff can provide us some data. We'll Anything working. else, Joe? Yeah, no, he, uh, Scott says we'll be working on that for sure. And then uh, the other thing, the other only other point I wanted to make is there you guys were all called experts in this. Uh, you don't necessarily have to be. I am a resource. So if people have questions, especially maybe junior counselors that uh, haven't actually been through this rodeo like the rest of you have, uh, feel free to hit me up and I can kind of give you a, a more like baseline understanding of the SIZ. And uh, maybe before then we start to tweak it, you'll you'll kind of get a, a gist of it. So I just want to offer my services as a resource. Okay, thank, thank you, Joe. All right, with um, that's going to wrap up our work session agenda. Um, we are going to take about a five minute recess between, so we'll start the city council meeting at seven thirty five because CTD five needs a few minutes to change things over. So with that, I will take a motion to adjourn. Are we staying on this meeting? That yes. was my question. Do we stay on the same link? We're on the same link for this. It's a different link for the exec. So you can shut off your camera after we adjourn this work session. I, I get a motion for that. I move that we adjourn. I will second. It's been moved by Councillor Spoon, seconded by Councillor Varwig. All those in favor, it's a non-debatable motion. All right. We'll see you at 735.